Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news podcast. Please don't forget the donate button at the top of the webpage. We're in a matching grant campaign. You'll see all the details uh, explaining the matching grant at the top of the page. When President-elect Joe Biden becomes commander-in-chief of the most powerful war machine in human history, it's not clear which Joe Biden we will be getting. Is it the Biden who supported the Iraq War and comes out of a foreign policy tradition of Truman and Kennedy, cold warriors who massively built out the military-industrial complex, Truman, who directed the fascist and racist Air Force General Curtis LeMay, to drop atomic bombs on Japan and later directed LeMay to kill millions of Koreans. Kennedy, who started the process that led to the Vietnam War and brought the world to the edge of nuclear annihilation in a pointless confrontation with the Soviet Union, a Cold War used to justify the greatest investment in military spending outside of a major war. Or will we get the Biden that fought for the Iran nuclear agreement, who apparently opposed a trillion-dollar investment in modernizing the American nuclear weapons arsenal, and was reported to be against the invasion of Libya. When it comes to rivalry with China, when we get beyond the inflammatory rhetoric, will Biden work with China to deal with climate and a host of other issues, or will he try to show how strong he is and please the China hawks who want him to contain China and weaken its global economic influence? Well, to better understand what we might expect from the Biden administration, let's start by taking a look at the roots of Democratic Party foreign policy. And joining to do that is Vijay Prashad. Vijay is a historian, a journalist, a commentator. He's the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and the chief editor of Leftward Books. His latest book is Washington Bullets, a history of the CIA of the coups and assassinations. Thanks very much for joining us, Vijay. Thanks, Paul. Always great to be with you. Thank you. So to understand the roots of how the Democratic Party pursues war and foreign policy, why don't we start with Roosevelt, who in 1939 or so denounced bombing of civilians in Europe as barbaric, and then he joined. Uh, he ordered American planes to join in the firebombing of Dresden, and burning alive hundreds of thousands of civilians in Japan. Roosevelt, who continued developing the nuclear bomb, even after it was clear Hitler had not, was not developing one. So if you think that's a good place to start understanding how the Democratic Party thinks about foreign policy, why don't you pick it up from there? Well, you know, Paul, it's good that you start with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because by all accounts, he is the gold standard of American liberalism, or at least Democratic Party liberalism. Um, and yet, if you look at FDR and then jump forward some decades to the next great shining star of Democratic Party liberalism, that's John F. Kennedy, um, both FDR, Roosevelt, and John F. Kennedy um, oscillate between this hesitancy to use the full force of the United States uh, to use charm, a charm offensive. R you may remember FDR started the good neighbor policy uh, with the Latin American countries, with the Caribbean countries. Uh, John F. Kennedy as well, you know, famously uh, after Nixon's quite catastrophic journey around South America, John F. Kennedy with Jacqueline Onassis, well, at the time, Jacqueline Kennedy, um, you know, was very much uh, on the one side uh, in the belief that diplomacy, charm, uh, using the American values, you know, the city on the hill um, and so on, was going to win the day for the United States. Th there was always that one side of Democratic Party liberalism. But it was a very fragile side because it would snap to the other 
end to the other in the other direction rather quickly and so you get the other side which is the full force of us power military power uh, to be used when appropriate and not necessarily to be used homeopathically but to be used allopathically in all its force um, you know uh, you see this with uh, john f kennedy because kennedy comes to power you know great charm and so on and then what do you see with the dulles brothers they attempt to overthrow the government in cuba that's very famous the bay of pigs invasion uh, but it's not just bay of pigs it's a range of different invasions by the marines including in thailand very little um, you know understood invasion by the us marines into thailand uh, you know you see this use of us power um, quite i would say without much hesitancy so with democratic party liberalism you oscillate as i said between on the one side this public charm and on the other side ruthless power i recently read barack obama's new memoir promised land and i mean i'm not recommending it because i found it evasive i found it untrue in many parts and i also found it to be in a way self aggrandizing which is not not something that you expect uh, to see in such a long book i mean frankly i've read kissinger's books and he's less self aggrandizing uh, than barack obama is in this particular book but but let's leave that aside he describes a scene in the book which i think captures this oscillation between great charm and ruthless use of american power because face it united states has the most powerful military can bomb anywhere can create havoc anywhere from the skies from its you know uh, missiles drones and so on so in the memoir he describes the hit list the kill list you know this is famously a man who was against the death penalty when he was a lawyer in chicago um a man who comes from that kind of the charm school of democratic party liberalism you know such a charming guy i mean right everybody seems to accept that i used to play a game when obama was running in 08 uh, in the primary and in the election i i used to insist to myself that i read his speeches and not watch because if you watched he was so damn charming you would just want to believe what he said where if you read the speeches you said oh this is just some you know center right democrat speaking that's a very in fact that's a very good thing but now unfortunately obama's voice is in my head so in reading the memoir the charm does come through but you can see there is a sequence obama john f kennedy you know Uh, FDR there's a, there is this trajectory so here's this man from that school of democratic party liberalism excited the base in in various ways comes to power comes into the white house now he is informed that he has the power to assassinate people around the world without a warrant without an investigation without a trial without all the basic architecture of liberalism you can just put a name on the list and the person is assassinated that's an extraordinary power that's a godlike power now you'd imagine this sort of democratic party liberalism would you know hesitate and say look this is not on we need to have trials and we need to arrest people they need to have a right to defend themselves just the basic you know points that are there not only in the us constitution but you know hello in international law no obama accepts the enormous responsibility you know this is the kind of a way they think about it enormous responsibility bestowed upon the united states to maintain order and he says that his chief of staff told him that the reason we need to do this the reason we need to sit on thursday in the situation room and go over a list of people that have to be killed and you have to sign off on this killing the reason we have to do this isn't actually about the enormous responsibility of american power and so on but it's because a democratic party a liberal democratic party president should not look weak i mean that is something that should chill people um you know when you have the appearance of strength allows you to use this amazing awesome amount of power that is going to destroy the lives of god knows how many people this is chilling so when we say let's look at biden's record and so on i fear that you know whatever the oscillation towards reason towards liberalism whatever that might be um, the enormous capacity of the united states to wreak havoc in the world 
married with this hesitancy amongst Democratic Party politicians not to appear weak um, makes them very dangerous people when they're in the White House. So I, I don't have a great deal of um, you know, anticipation that Biden is going to be the peace president. I fear that once more, we're going to have another war president because they've, in a sense, Paul, they've all been war presidents. Uh, well, before we dig in more to what we might expect from Biden, dig in more to the, the mindset of this kind of liberal face, which is, you know, as you say, Roosevelt is the liberal face. And, and in fact, the New Deal was about as liberal as domestic policy ever got. Um, and of course, he was doing it to save a system of private ownership, as he said himself. But it was a rational approach to it, as opposed to fascism, which was really the alternative in the 30s. Um, and he, he even says, there's a speech from Roosevelt in 39, uh, where he talks about corporate control of government when a, a, gr a specific group of corporations start to control government. He says this is the definition of fascism. And he, he, he warned against this barbaric bombing of uh, civilians during World War II. And then he, he allows uh, this guy, General LeMay, to become head of Stratcom, the guy is a fascist. The guy is, he's, I'm not, when I say he's a racist, the guy ran for vice president after he retired. He was George Wallace's vice president. And apparently he was so crazy, right wing and uh, militarist, that Wallace started getting embarrassed by LeMay because LeMay was advocating first strike against the Soviet Union and, and he was making Wallace look crazy. But not only did Roosevelt have this guy as head of Stratcom, and orders the bomb, the atomic bomb, fire bombing, which was actually worse than the atomic bombs, because they, they killed, in, in one night in Tokyo, and they killed 100,000 civilians in one night. And people should look this up, because uh, one of the guys who was one of the pilots wrote about what he saw from the air, and he describes tens of thousands of people running into the canals to try to uh, escape the flames. And the water itself is already boil at boiling temperature. People start to melt. And then there's so many thousands of people running, they can't prevent themselves from being forced into the canal. The bridges, the steel gets white hot. Like the description from this pilot is, is incredible. And Roosevelt and then had to know all this. There's no way these reports don't get to him. But the, the same liberal mindset that can do the New Deal can accept the slaughter of tens of thousands of people. And then Truman, as we know now, uh, uh, authorizes the dropping of the atomic bomb when Japan's already uh, ready to uh, surrender. The whole thing was, was unnecessary. Um, and then again in Korea, I mean, it's not like, you know, they got some, after doing it, in Japan, they do it again in Korea, which never gets talked about. I th what is it, like three million Koreans, I think, were killed? And the same guy, General Curtis LeMay again. So, what, I mean, what is this bloody mindset where they can think of themselves even of being, oh, we're, we're liberals, we're not like the Republicans. And then do, I, I don't know if it's more dastardly, because I'm sure the Republicans in the same situation would be as or even more, but completely dastardly. You know, there are two books I'd like to add to the reading list. And fortunately for people in the United States, they are both written by people from the United States. So you don't have to doubt the authenticity of uh, the writer. <laughs> because I know that there is a, let's say, there's a seam of parochialism that sets in, where if I gave you the name of a Japanese writer or a German writer even, you might not believe them. But I highly recommend that people go back and take out their high school copy of Kurt, uh, of, uh, of, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. Uh, Slaughterhouse-Five is Vonnegut's account of being in Dresden when Dresden is firebombed. And it's exactly those kind of descriptions. It is one of the most powerful anti-war books. And I don't even think that Vonnegut meant it to be an anti-war book. Vonnegut meant it to be a sincere account of something that totally totally bothered him, you know, 
for the totality of his life. The second book is, is um, well, there are two, but I, I'm going to suggest one. John Hershey's book, Hiroshima, uh, has to be read again. Again, these are books that I believe used to be read in US high schools. I'm not sure it's still being read, but Hiroshima is an extraordinary book. Uh, Hershey goes right after this horrendous act on Japan, arrives in Hiroshima, he's there with a legion of Japanese journalists, and he writes for the New Yorker, perhaps the most sincere piece of writing that's ever appeared in that magazine, and his book is extraordinary. I, I highly recommend it. Well, you asked a very important question about how do we, how do we square this circle between people who have this high-minded sen sense of themselves and this ruthlessness? Um, in the book that I've written, Washington Bullets, it opens with Paul Nitzer's uh, journey to Japan because Nitzer also goes to Japan just after, you know, uh, Hershey's essay has appeared in the New Yorker. I mean, they knew already. Uh, you didn't even need um, internal secret, uh, you know, OSS, that is the, the intelligence agency briefings on what had happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Tokyo and so on. Nitzer was right there and he interviewed some of the leading generals and people for a long after action um, survey that they were doing. Now, here's a person who comes from that American, that U.S. elite, uh, that, you know, liberal establishment, let's call them, whether they were um, Rockefeller people or whether they were FDR people, it didn't matter. They were basically country club uh, elite from the United States, from the Eastern Seaboard. And he goes there and he sees the destruction wrought by both the atom bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, as you quite rightly pointed out, uh, the incendiary bombing of Tokyo. He sees this directly, he writes it about it in his report. And then very soon after, he and his team sitting in Washington, D.C., concoct a line which I have quoted, I think, for 20 years now, uh, because I think this is really important for an understanding of the bipartisan consensus around U.S. foreign policy. And the line hasn't changed, and it is quite simple. Of course, they use a term which is not used. It's arcane, and this refers back to their sort of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, you know, classics education. But they basically write in this important foundational document, never repudiated by the U.S. government. In other words, they've never said that the policy has changed. But this is the policy after World War II. They say the goal of U.S. policy is to seek preponderant power, to seek preponderant power. That's the goal of U.S. policy. You know, the, the gentler word thrown around now is primacy, that the United States must be, you know, well, I suppose if we're going to go all classics and Greek and Latin, it's primus inter pares, first among equals. Although I don't think that this elite sees anybody as their equal. They see themselves as superior to everybody. I mean, this is what in popular culture is known as U.S. exceptionalism. This is the kind of thing you see every time anybody runs for office in the United States of America, whether it's for city council all the way to the presidency, they'll always say it's the greatest country in the world, has a mission for the world, you know, God bless America, thank you God for making me a, a citizen of the United States and so on and so forth. There is this constant reiteration of the superiority of the United States and its mission for the whole planet. Now, I don't need you know, to be a psychologist or even a social psychologist to do an analysis of this. I'm not interested in analyzing this, but I know that this is the motivation. This is what drives them. You know, this sense that, oh gosh, we can't allow a multipolar world. We can't allow China or Russia or any other country to share the table with us. We have to drive the agenda. You know, what disturbed um, the this sort of liberal, conservative, bipartisan elite in the United States about Trump, what disturbed them was Trump was eroding the moral standing. What they saw, the self-image that they have of themselves, Trump was making them look buffoonish on the world stage. And they therefore wanted to return in a way to something that resembled uh, how they see themselves, which is, you know, um, this great colossus of liberalism that stomps around the world, putting out fires and telling people how to behave. I mean, I read the Pentagon documents you know, on a regular basis. And in the last 20 years, they've basically continued to say, we cannot tolerate any, anybody 
challenging the absolute authority of the United States of America, least of all China. And I just want to make a, a distinction, you know, as I end this answer, the distinction is the distinction between power and authority. I think nobody, nobody should have an illusion that US power is as much as it has been, you know, for a long time. And by power, I'll just give two examples. The United States has the largest military in the world. It can, as I say, bomb, destroy anybody. It has an enormous nuclear arsenal. Nobody can challenge the United States militarily in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Not a chance. Secondly, the United States continues to have an overwhelming advantage over world financial institutions. The dollar, even though marginally declining as a reserve currency, marginally declining in terms of the reconciliation of trade, you know how people uh, do their bilateral trade, Russia and China increasingly doing bilateral trade in rubles and in yuan, but nonetheless, there is no question the dollar is supreme around the planet. So United States power is not affected much. U.S. authority, on the other hand, has declined greatly. In other words, the United States is having a much harder time driving its own agenda, you know, whether it's in trade agreements or it's the climate issue or anything. I mean, recently, one third of the world's population signed a trade agreement. It's called the RCEP. You know, the, this is all the, the countries of Australia, Australasia, essentially, and, and, and you know, including China, as I said, Australia, Japan, countries that are in a military alliance with the United States against China have signed on to a trade agreement with China that excludes the United States. So U.S. power remains. Let's not have any illusions about that. But U.S. authority has eroded. And I think the return of Biden to the White House comes with all the language that says we want to reassert our authority again. So from the 1940s to the present, Paul, there's been no change in the broad policy, which is that the United States seeks preponderant power, will not allow any so-called rival to come onto the stage, and it has concocted all kinds of really insane hallucinatory theories about how China is a rival, and we could talk about that, because the Chinese have said repeatedly, we are not a rival. We don't want to become primus inter pares. We are not seeking preponderant power. But the United States is, and it's the decline of US authority that has, in a sense, if I might use a colloquial, this has freaked out the US elite. It's truly freaked them out. I mean, they don't know how to react to this decline of authority, and they don't also know how to react to the decline of their technological prowess. And you know, we can talk about that later, yeah. Well, just before we pick up on China, um, you make, I think, a very important point in the book. And again, it's, it's called Washington Bullets, and it, it, people should really read this. Uh, that this modern imperialism and the culture that goes with it is erected on the structure of colonialism and the culture and of, of colonialism and the, you know, one of the fundamental principles of that culture is that the peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, especially Asia and Africa, are essentially savages and are outside the realm of, of any uh, need for norms or regulation. I, I, in your book, you mentioned there's a, a couple of treaties at one point about how war is going to be fought, but it's only applicable to Europeans. Mind you, they wound up not following them anyway, but they weren't even making a an attempt to make it look like it would be applicable uh, to not, you know, outside the Anglo-American world and European world. Um, and of course, the United States is founded on slavery and genocide. And the approach of the Americans to the native peoples, uh, slavery as well, but the native people, because that was North and South had that approach, was that these people can be slaughtered for the sake of progress. Uh, in their mind, progress. And the sort of uh, ability to have such barbaric uh, uh, wiping out of civilians, uh, it's deeply rooted in, 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 in the elites and their culture. And I think that's another thing you keep raising in the book, which I think is very important. While we talk about Roosevelt and we talk about Biden and these individuals and even the parties, this is a reflection of how capitalism has ar arisen as a system. This is what's happened with, with the concentration of ownership, a system based on private ownership that's gotten to ridiculous proportions now 
of, of concentration of ownership. And these parties and this culture, you know, it reflects that as well as the, what's that great quote from Marx about the, uh, uh, the, the, the something of the past weighs like nightmares on the brains of the present. What's the... That's from the 18th, I think this is from the 18th Brumaire, yeah. where Marx writes that the, the, uh, the nightmare of the past weighs on the living, the people who are living. Or the memories so, yeah. of the past, at any rate, weigh like yeah. nightmares on the yeah. living. Uh, and, and so, you know, when we're, lo we're looking at both the Democratic Party and, and the Republican Party and this idea, which is a reflection of what, how they emerged as essentially a single superpower after World War II, and, and honestly, always were. This idea that it was a two superpower world, that was actually kind of a crock. Because while the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons, they, militarily, there was never a competition for global power. And not only that, you know, I've been, I'm doing this film with Daniel Ellsberg and I'm interviewing him and the great realization for him, who was a real cold warrior when he uh, goes to Rand Corporation, and starts advising uh, on, on the nuclear war strategy. His book, Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Strategist, is the, the project I'm working with him. And he starts to realize that when the, this guy, same guy, Curtis LeMay, who's head of STRATCOM, is telling the president and the world that the Soviet Union has 1,000 ICBMs and, can, and has the ability to strike first against the United States. And it turns out that they had four. And, and Ellsberg starts to realize, wait a second, these guys actually aren't planning a military expansion or global presence. They're not, whatever they are domestically, they are not a global domineering power. They're not trying to take over the world. Of course, but the entire basis of the militarization that takes place in the United States, which they use as a form of stimulus, because you can't get away with New Deal anymore because the elites don't want another New Deal, but they don't mind stimulus in the form of military spending. So Democratic Party domestic policy gets so linked with militarization as a, as a form of stimulus. And then we get Kennedy and, and so on. So, okay, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or go ahead. Yeah, well, well, firstly, that thing about the military as stimulus, Ruth Gilmore, Ruthie Gilmore wrote about this and called it military Keynesianism. I think that's a very good and apposite phrase. It is a kind of military Keynesianism, and it's, I think, largely uh, restricted to the United States. But let's put that aside. I, I do want to return to the colonial roots, as it were, and this refusal to accept uh, culturally that there's been a shift in the world. So let's just take Libya, Paul, because Libya is an extraordinary example of this. The first evidence we have of aerial bombardment is in 1911 against some uh, communities in Libya. When Italian planes go and just bomb from the skies, you know, people riding on horseback, people riding on camel, they don't have even guns that can reach halfway up to the planes, you know, and they're just ruthlessly killed. Uh, from the air. The Italians write uh, of this in their reviews of their bombing runs. They say that, you know, aerial bombardment, they say, is educational. It's pedagogical. Um, we will show the savages, and of course, this is how they wrote, um, that they need to behave themselves. And the Italian futurists uh, were very much behind um, this bombing campaign. Partly, they were excited by the idea of this big destructive project as an educational project. I mean, it's repulsive, you know, because on the ground, real people, entire families are being butchered uh, with no chance. There's, there's no honor in war. You know, the idea that you have combatants fighting each other and that both have the, uh, the opportunity that they might die in that. that. That's how old war used to be understood. There was a certain honor and dignity in combat. This, this is not combat. This is slaughter. That was 1911 Libya. 100 years later, to the month almost, Paul, the NATO planes go and bomb Libya again. I mean, it's incredible. It's the 100th anniversary of the first aerial bombardment, and NATO goes and bombs that country. Again, there was no way for anybody in Libya to retaliate against the, the American and French Raphael bombers, which bombed from too high up. The Libyans just didn't have the capacity, didn't have the skill to take them on. They just bombed the country left, right, and center. 
Okay, they bombed using a UN mandate, that is UN Security Council Resolution 1973. Uh, this mandate, and I read this very carefully, asked for an after bombing review of the bombing campaign. You know, it's boilerplate for when you allow a chapter seven resolution on the UN Charter. When you allow a chapter seven resolution, which is not utilized very much by the UN Security Council, it allows member states to use force. It immediately kicks in that after the action, there has to be a review. Well, um, many people, human rights organizations, the UN itself, journalists, I personally also asked uh, NATO headquarters, we asked, have you considered an after action review, after bombing review, based on the requirements of 1973, the UN resolution 1973? Well, Peter Olson, the lead attorney for the NATO uh, office, put out a statement. He sent a letter. I have a copy of the letter. The letter essentially says the following. No, we are not going to submit our bombing information to any independent agency. We'll do our own review. It's a secret review. We're not going to do this. And it said that if there is any evidence of civilians being killed in Libya, it was entirely accidental because NATO cannot ipso facto, NATO cannot ipso facto, NATO cannot by definition by definition, NATO cannot conduct war crimes. That is to say, Europeans and people of European descent are not war criminals. The war criminal, and this is demonstrated in the kind of people that are brought before the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the, the war criminals are non-Europeans. Uh, they are the ones who are savages, and they continue to be savages. So in 1911, you bomb Libya, saying we need to use the bombing to teach the savages to basically subordinate themselves to our authority. In 2011, you bomb Libya again, and this time you say, well, the savages are war criminals because Gaddafi was genocidal, even though there is no evidence of any genocide in Libya in February of, and March of 2011. It was all made up by the Saudi press. There was fighting, but there was no genocidal activity. But the savage is always going to be the savage, and the European is always civilized, even though the European ruthlessly bombed Libya on the 100th anniversary of aerial bombardment. Now, you tell me, when does this culture start reflecting on itself and wonder about its ruthlessness in the world and the way it, in a sense, you know, projects ruthlessness onto people who are not ruthless? You know, it's always Saddam Hussein is the butcher. It's always Bashar al-Assad is the butcher. But listen, you know, uh, the, the UN, um, the US ambassador to the United Nations, Madeleine Albright, is the one who admitted on US television. You, you remember this. She admits on US television. She said, yes, because of US policy, half a million Iraqi children have killed. And she says, later she said she re regrets using that phrase, but she said it. She says on television, and the clip is on YouTube. She says on television, half a million Iraqi children killed by US policy is a price worth paying. Is that not genocidal behavior? You no, know, no, no, no. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I think it was a price we're willing to pay. As if okay, they're, whether they're the ones paying. I mean, it's worse than what you said. <laughs> It's true, and but here she directly admits culpability, complicity, whatever you want to say, in the murder of half a million Iraqi children, forget grown-ups and so on. And she will never be considered to be genocidal or a maniac or authoritarian. These terms are reserved for the darker diabolical forces in the world, which is to say there are human beings out there who face the aerial bombardment and are always going to be accused of making the West bomb them. Because, you know, again, this is the old uh, domestic violence justification. Uh, here is a man uh, hitting a, a woman and the man says, you made me hit you. Uh, this is the weakest, most diabolical form of argumentation, but somehow, this, which doesn't, uh, is not uh, permitted to, you know, be taken seriously in a court of law, is perfectly acceptable when it comes to international conflict and the use of power to subordinate countries. So, I mean, this is a cultural flaw, uh, you know, Paul. This is not even just about capitalism. It's not just about, 
you know, understanding capitalism helps us understand why these things are necessary. But we need to go deeper into a flaw in, let's call it Western culture, to understand the arrogance of this use of power against people, not just power, but the arrogance of the use of violence against people, terrible, terrifying violence. I mean, I don't think it's just Western. I mean, if you look even in the development of China, the development of China as a country, the Han Chinese and the empire was brutally built on slaughters of whole populations of all kinds of other tribes and ethnic minorities. And I mean, you know, it's not like this is uh, just Western. It's just in the more recent history, the West has been sort of dominant. Um, and, and, but the, I guess the difference maybe is the West tries to pretend they're not barbaric when they're just as barbaric as anything in, in human history. In fact, more because the armies ha in terms of weaponry are capable of so much more devastation than any armies in the past. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to be heard as saying that, you know, the rest of the world is, is all kind and peaceful. I mean, after all, Attila the Hun uh, and so on have their own reputations and one doesn't need to be lawyers for them. You know, they were proud of what they were doing and they were ruthless. But I think the point is more what you were beginning to say in the second part just now, which is that a structure has been developed. Um, in, in, in largely in the culture in societies in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, where there is a reflexive sense that these countries use their power abroad, outside their territories for good, and that um, they use their power essentially to shape the world and to be, as they say, to be the policeman. Now, this is an ironic phrase, the global policeman or the world's policeman, because, you know, I mean, Black Lives Matter. We know how the police within the territory of the United States and Canada and in, in Western Europe, we know how the police forces act. So it's kind of odd that nonetheless, there is this, you know, a very uh, shiny image of we are the world's policemen, as if that's a good thing. I mean, it, look at the way your police behave domestically. Um, you know, Freddie Gray, uh, let's name their names, Brianna Taylor and so on. Well, I can name thousands, millions of names of people, of my friends as well, who were killed in these wars. Um, you know, uh, people who didn't deserve to die. Men, the ones I know are journalists uh, who were killed in, in warfare. Um, you know, and well, you know, maybe it's not such a, a simple thing when you say we are the world's policemen. But what they're saying is that when we exercise power, uh, we are exercising power for good. Now, the very fact that we end up slaughtering millions of people seems irrelevant. And I, I think that's a moral question. And that's why I say, Paul, it's a question in, rooted in a cultural conversation about, you know, racial uh, understanding, the kind of superiority, this feeling that, well, if we do the bombing, we don't commit war crimes. That's what Peter Olson wrote. I didn't write that. He somehow has this image that when NATO bombs, they don't kill civilians. Well, how is that even possible? I mean, that's just not possible when you look at the technology. They don't have such smart bombs. You know, there will be one or two stray bombs. Well, then Olson says it's an accident. We didn't deliberately kill civilians, whereas savages deliberately kill civilians. This is very ironic, by the way, that these are the this is the kind of language being used because we know that ever since aerial bombardment starts, the advantage of aerial bombardment is that you can go beyond the lines, the enemy lines, and bomb cities. And from the very beginning of the history of aerial bombardment, the bombing of civilians has been part of the strategy of using bombardment. Look at Curtis LeMay, who you referred to earlier. Look at what the United States did in Korea. You know, bombed uh, 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 places where people lived, residential areas, but actually very much worse than that, bombed dams, bombed agricultural areas, created a famine. Look at what the United States did in Vietnam. I visited Vietnam and, you know, I was very uh, sensitive to the idea that the Vietnamese were struggling to build socialism in the country. And I was questioning them about agriculture and so on. And they said, you know, it's an interesting thing you raise agriculture because for 
decade plus, the United States used the worst kind of chemical weapons, you know, Agent Orange, Napalm, and so on, in one of the more fertile belts of Vietnam's agricultural uh, heartland. That was just saturated with chemical weapons. And one of the people I was talking to was a government official said to me that we have estimated in some parts of where the chemical warfare happened, we will it will take generations before we can risk eating anything grown there. Now, let me ask you, is that not bombardment of civilians? Not the killing necessarily only of civilians at that point, but it's a bombardment of generations of people who will not be able to be food sovereign because their, their soil is saturated by this stuff made by American corporations dropped by the military. So that's actually what I'm trying to uh, get at here is, and I think in the book, I, I try to make that point repeatedly in different stories, which is that there is this very bizarre cultural assessment, this uh, self-understanding that somehow people in the United States and Canada, and by God, let's not forget Canada here, because the Canadians seem to have an even higher sense of themselves than the people of the United States in very many parts of Western Europe, in France, in Germany, and so on, the low countries, Holland, Belgium, there is this great sense that, you know, we are somehow moral people. And when we do, if we are forced into military action, by God, we only do it the, in the very best way. The Nobel Prize for Peace is named after a man who invented in the West dynamite. Dynamite was invented in other countries previously. That's fine. But, you know, Alfred Nobel was an arms manufacturer. And here we then give the Nobel Prize for Peace. I think the, not irony, Paul, because I'm not talking about irony here. The hypocrisy, cultural hypocrisy is just there in the Nobel, um, in the Nobel story. Um, on a somewhat more positive note, I think there's been a shift in public opinion. During uh, colonialism, it, I think on the whole, there were always some constituency that was opposed to colonialism, but on the whole, to go conquer a country, plunder it, bring the booty back to England or whatever European country it was, it was perfectly acceptable. In fact, you know, you were doing well if you were winning the plundering contest, you know, between different European countries and so on. Um, I, maybe even up to even World War II, um, it was not seen as really such a bad thing to go take over the Philippines or do something else. But after the defeat of Hitler and the experience of, of the peoples of the world, the Nuremberg trial, uh, this was condemned, these wars. Of, they were called wars of aggression. It was no longer it's okay to plunder. This, the highest crime is a war of aggression. And that people got that to a large extent. And then the Vietnam War for the American people, you know, they had to be, again, tricked, lied to to get into the war with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Oh, we were attacked first. And, and every, I mean, you, you go through all the American wars and practically every one starts with some phony provocation from the other side when really... Many of the phony provocations have come from the American side time and time again. Ellsberg was talking about provocation as one of the important pillars of U.S. Uh, military policy, phony provocations. You should see that. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the uh, they released the, uh, some of the transcripts of meetings Robert Kennedy was in when they were planning an attack on Cuba. And this isn't very much known, that just before Khrushchev puts these weapon, nuclear weapons in Cuba, there was a plan for a massive invasion of Cuba. And there was a list of things they were going to do, including get us a, an airplane that looked like a commercial aircraft, paint it with the colors of some national airlines, and then shoot it down. And then blame the shooting down of the aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft on the Cubans. Uh, and that's only one example of the kinds of things they, they were planning. But after the Vietnam War, uh, the Americans did not have a taste for this war of aggression, and they came to understand that Vietnam was a war of aggression. It wasn't about defending democracy. Large numbers of people. And the next time they want to really have a major war, Iraq, <clears throat> they have a 9-11, very conveniently. And then, of course, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. And they're, and they're able, 
to, tr to justify another what is essentially war of aggression. Um, so I think there is a change in public opinion where at the very least they have to lie where they didn't have to lie before. Uh, the lies do eventually get exposed. And so maybe now we're, we are in somewhat a different period uh, from the times we've been talking about. Because after Vietnam and now after the Iraq war turned out to be all bullshit, the, the, there were no weapons of mass destruction, uh, even some of the people that voted for Trump were actually, uh, they thought he was a, a, a non-interventionist and some of the, even some of the people voting for him were doing, thought they were supporting a non-interventionist policy. I, I actually don't believe that's true about Trump, but that's not the point. The point is people thought it was. So I, I think now that Biden's coming into power here, he's, he is dealing with the people that are very wary of the kinds of things the elites have done in the past. Um, and uh, so uh, at, at any rate, it, there's a factor here that's somewhat different than some of the periods we were talking about before. This is not to say that the people running this foreign policy and military policy have gained any great morality. But I think not just Americans, people all over the world, I mean, millions of people uh, marched against the Iraq war. Uh, there is a consciousness here that perhaps wasn't existing before, at least not at the scale. Well, that's why I wrote this book, because um, I was actually quite horrified, Paul, by the coup d'etat conducted in Bolivia in November 2019, when, um, you know, it was a textbook coup. And I, I, I very well remember three days before the coup uh, took place, I got a call from friends in, in Bolivia saying, this is what's happening. The life of Morales is in threat. Uh, I called Noam Chomsky, you know, we hastily wrote a statement, released it for the Latin American press. It came in newspapers across the hemisphere. Uh, and then the next day, uh, General Williams Kaliman goes to see Evo Morales and says, you have to step down. Um, now, it was extraordinary to me to see the Wurlitzer, you know, the great uh, musical um, instrument go into effect as the media came in, the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the Guardian, all of them said there's no coup. Uh, Morales has overstayed his welcome. By the way, uh, Angela Merkel has been in office longer than Evo Morales. Nobody says she's overstayed her welcome. Uh, so let's just have that clear. And I've never heard any conversation about that. And anyway, leave that aside. Evo Morales has overstayed his welcome. There was fraud in the election. They were repeating all this stuff. Interesting. Then I saw left media in the West start to say Evo Morales overstayed his welcome. He was bad on the environment bad on the environment, this is the guy who started the Cochabamba process long before the Green New Deal was a term. They pick up one or two stray incidences in the Amazon, a road and so on, and just junk his, his entire, um, his record. So I heard all this stuff and I said, oh my God, people don't understand how these things work. So when I wrote the book, the second part two of the book is called Manual for Regime Change in which it essentially goes over uh, step by step, you know, part one, lobby public opinion, part two, appoint the right man on the ground, that's the ambassador, part three, make sure the generals are ready, and in this case, it was Williams Kaliman, part four, make the economy scream, part five, diplomatic isolation, you know, this is exactly what they've done since Cuba, part six, organized mass protests. In the, in the case of Bolivia, these were semi-fascist organizations led by that, that really gangster Luis Camacho and his crowd. Um, and it, it, they can take pictures of them and it looks like it's a mass demonstration. Then part seven, green light the coup. This was certainly green lighted and we can, you know, we don't have time to talk about it. And then assassinations, you know, the way they went after, there was a massacre. They went and humiliated people like Patricia Arce. It was basically the manual of regime change. And I used material from Guatemala and Guyana coups in the 1950s to explain these basic principles of how a coup works. The last point is called production of amnesia. I was interested in the production of amnesia because what happens is a coup takes place, 
1954 in Guatemala, a coup takes place and then amnesia has to be produced in such a way that eventually after 20 odd years, you'll release the documents on the coup. You'll show that the CIA actually did the coup, but it doesn't seem to matter in public opinion. People say, well, it was in the past. It's always in the past. Everything is in the past. Nothing is ever in the present. It's a very clever, clever strategy. You know, you don't deny that it was in the past. You just say we learned our lesson. We don't do it anymore. And then here, here it is. Here's Haiti, 2004. Here's, um, you know, uh, uh, Honduras, 2009. I mean, for God's sake, here's Thailand in 2014. And then we have, um, we're back to Bolivia, 2019. And so the reason I wrote the book was to basically go to people, young people in particular, who won't know much of this history and say, listen, friends, this is a cliche. They do this over and over again. And yes, even in 1954, they didn't come out and say, we're doing it for United Fruit Company, in which, you know, the Dulles brothers had a stake. That is both Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. It's a great scandal that in Washington, D.C., Paul, the two airports are named after Dulles and Reagan. I mean, you know, of all people, at least one of them should be a pretending liberal, you know, rather than both of these ruthless imperialists. At least one of them should have some sort of pretense of charm and liberalism. Neither the Dulles brothers were charming. Um, they had a stake in United Fruit and they overthrew Jacob Arbenz because he was threatening what? He was threatening marginally challenging United Fruit, not even threatening to expropriate all its lands, which is what I would do if I was the president of Guatemala in 1954. He wasn't at that level. He was just doing some modest land reform and they overthrew him. But they didn't say it was for that. They said it was because of communism. It was because, you know, the Communist Party was friendly with Arbenz's wife and blah, 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 blah. The New York Times wrote puff pieces, which the CIA basically faxed to them. That's how the, the reporting worked. And I'm telling you, it's identical now. Okay, I, I might not be alive when the documentation is released, but we will find, and I'm not going to name them, that the reporters who reported, uh, you know, from on, on the on the, the democratic transfer of power to Jeanette Ar uh, Anies in Bolivia, those reporters basically got their commanding orders from, if not the CIA, the State Department. I mean, there was an election in Venezuela on the 6th of December. I'm going to name him. Tom Phillips of The Guardian wrote a piece um, where Mr. Phillips' byline was Rio de Janeiro. He wasn't even in Caracas. He wrote it from Rio de Janeiro. And he repeated words like, charade and so on that are there in the State Department statement, the U.S. State Department statement signed by Mike Pompeo. I mean, it's not a case that you necessarily need to buy up these reporters, you know, or pay them or whatever. But there is a culture of complicity that is shared between these reporters and these events. And then later, when the Bolivian people with great courage, you know, go to the polls and in a huge majority, you know, it's a, it's a landmark thing that they overthrew a coup in a democratic election and brought Lucho uh, uh, Arce to power as the new president of Bolivia, who has now welcomed Evo Morales and, you know, is on stages with him across the country every day. Evo Morales has had those court cases of fraud removed from the the court. The courts have said there was no basis for these cases in the first place. This was part of the coup process. This happened last year, Paul. This happened last year. This is going to happen again. I agree with you. There is a shift in public opinion. People are much more decent perhaps than they used to be, but they're not vigilant enough and they don't hold these gangsters who run things, who have their levers on power. They don't hold them to account often enough. Look, uh, UN Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan said in 2004, to his shame, he didn't say that in 2003. In 2004, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who studied at McAllister College, very close friends with most of the American elite. In 2004, he tells BBC that the uh, George W. Bush's war against Iraq is an illegal war. He used that phrase. The head of the UN uses the word illegal. There is not one piece of accountability uh, faced by George W. Bush, faced by Dick Cheney, faced by Donald Rumsfeld, faced by Tony Blair. Not one of them is ever going to see a court of law. You know, if something illegal is done by somebody, as far as I understand the word illegal, that means that there is a jurisdiction somewhere 
somewhere there is a jurisdiction through which you are capable of saying something is illegal. That means somebody should be able to call you to account for your illegal activity. None of them get called to account. So, I mean, I'm with you, Paul. There is a shift, but it's not really a consequential shift because until you are able, vigilant enough, strong-willed enough to demand that people who conduct these actions are brought to account, until that happens, I'm afraid I'm rather pessimistic about the direction of world history. Well, I won't be able to change your mind on that because I'm not very optimistic either. But the issue of media, obviously, people don't know what's going on in Bolivia. They barely know what's going on in their own country, never mind Bolivia. Uh, people don't know. And the media is so... Uh, uh, dominated, except for the you know little things like us and a few other things. But you know we talk about this, but we don't have any way to get to the majority of people. I mean, you know, most of the people that voted for Trump, uh, their media is Fox and other right wing media. They don't even hear CNN, and of course CNN can be uh, complete warmongers because war is good for their business. So they don't get access to any of this information. Uh, they don't know the history and, and, and the uh, deterioration of the public school system. I mean, people don't even get taught any history that matters if they get taught history at all. But there's moments, uh, there's moments when it does break through. Uh, you know, the lead up to the Iraq war, it didn't matter. They invaded anyway. But it was a moment where a lot of people marched that have never marched before. Um, there, there, uh, what I was saying is the difference now is that a straightforward, open war of aggression, war of plunder, if people understand that's what it is, they won't accept it. Where in, you know, a hundred years ago, they might have accepted it, even embraced it. Um, I mean, I'm not even saying there aren't sections of the population now that might still say, well, we're white and we're superior and we're American, so fuck everybody else. Yeah, let's go. And I don't know what percentage of the population might believe that. Um, maybe it's even in that 20, 25 percent. But, uh, you know, that think God's chosen the Americans. And so whatever God's chosen people do is OK. Uh, but there's a shift. Yeah, I mean, just to just to just to put a, a point on that, I mean, Trump openly said we should just go and take the oil from Iraq and so on. And in the waning days of the Trump administration, he has very cynically, um, you know, violated I don't know how many UN resolutions by basically, and he doesn't have the right to do it by donating the Western Sahara, the Sahrawi people's lands to Morocco, and basically donating the Palestinian project to the Israelis. I mean, violated so many UN resolutions. I mean, this was done brazenly. You know, I, I just I just don't see when it comes to the the crushing, crushing blow to the Sahrawi people, um, you know, by this quid pro quo where Morocco uh, recognizes Israel and Israel that is basically taking over East Jerusalem and the West Bank, Syria's Golan Heights, all of which Trump gave Israel permission to take away. He doesn't have, he doesn't have the authority to give permission, but that's what's happened. And at the same time, he's given permission as a quid pro quo to Morocco to seize the Western Sahara officially. I mean, I don't just, I just don't see the voices of dissent. I don't even see them among the serried ranks of the squad and so on in the Democratic Party. I haven't seen anybody come out there and say, this is an outrage against UN resolutions. The UN mandate uh, to maintain the ceasefire between Morocco and Western Sahara, which was first set up in 1991, was renewed just about six months ago, you know, after, since 1991, just about six months ago, it was renewed. And what happens? The United States just says, you can have it, pals, if you recognize Israel. I mean, this is just grotesque. And I just, I look around me and I feel even the left media, has basically sat on its, you know, on its hands on this. I mean, how many people have written about Western Sahara or commented about this long standing occupation of the Western Sahara backed by Saudi Arabia initially, or by, it was Morocco's occupation, backed by Saudi Arabia, backed by the United Arab Emirates and behind all of this for years backed by the United States government. Now with this in the waning days of the Trump administration, I just don't see enough evidence to say that we have really walked 
in a human humanitarian direction out of that old imperial past uh it's a long journey oh, i uh, in my mind it's a long journey from uh apes to human and we're only a little part way there and uh it's a barbaric system uh but anyway I, i'm i'm a little more optimistic about some shift in american public opinion uh but of course it's the heart of the empire and it's not very hard to pull off another terrorist attack on american soil in which case enough people will get outraged and and something terrible could happen so as a practical matter uh, i guess we'll see but I, I i take some hope from even if the progressives in the in the congress aren't on the sahara story and maybe they don't even understand israel palestine that well sometimes um still They've, there, there is resolutions to stop the support for the Saudi war in Yemen. Um, there's some things that can be built on. I don't think it's entirely uh, terrible here. No, I, I agree. I agree with you on that. Um, I, I think, in a way, neither, neither you nor I should exaggerate the point here. I mean, it's this is a struggle. This is a fight. Um, and I mean, the fight is is well worth being involved in. I mean, I, you and I have been involved in this fight our entire lives, and I don't think we're going to at this point uh, either <laughs> surrender from the fight or get to, or on the other side, you know, just get to uh, jazzed up by where we are. Uh, it's a fight. Well, let, let me let me just say one thing. Why are we even bothering to talk to each other on camera here? Uh, one, because we still think there's some kind of hope. And two, one of the most critical issues. Uh, you know, Gore, you talked about amnesia. Gore Vidal used to say USA stands for the United States of amnesia. That was his line. And then he changed it later. It got so bad he called it the United States of Alzheimer's. But, but there's been a deliberate attempt in the public education system and the media to completely uneducate, not educate people about even basics of history. Like, why did they choose Hiroshima and Nagasaki to drop nuclear bombs? Because almost every other city had already been burnt down in the fire bombings. They were the only things left to bomb because it wasn't like they had some strategic thing. In fact, the whole thing was bullshit. They just wanted to show they had the bomb and not just to the Japanese, maybe more so to the Soviet Union. The vast majority of people don't know and have never heard that the reason they picked Hiroshima and Nagasaki is because they'd already deliberately burnt down every other city in Japan. People don't know. No, quite right. I mean, I, I, I have to say on the point of hope, um, I mean, and this, this is something that's important to me. I wrote this book thinking very much about, and actually I've, my work in the last period has been very influenced by my dear friend, Eduardo Galliano, because years ago I asked Galliano how he could write such beautiful, beautiful books about torture. And he said that a book about something so ugly as torture, or in this case about assassinations and coups and, and so on, should not replicate what um, the bad side of history does. We have to find a way to excavate in that story, hope and resilience and, and, and so on. And that's why this book is filled with poetry. I mean, it, it starts with poetry, it ends with poetry. The end of part two is a complete poem about a war and who comes to clean up after a war. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like um, the lifting of the human imagination is very important and and that's exactly that's what that's what we do i mean if somebody said to me what's your profession i would say and it sounds terribly arrogant and i apologize for sounding arrogant i, I don't have a better word for it uh, you know we say journalist or we say historian whatever but no i think our job is to try and somehow uh, maybe with our fingers and fingernails to lift the human imagination just even if it's a centimeter or a millimeter above where it is you know that's our job that's the job of poets that's the job of people who are political trade unionists agricultural worker union you know shapers and so on school teachers i mean the job is just to lift the human imagination a little bit and hope that people then find the air that comes under gives them some buoyancy and they can fly higher i mean i think that's what we're trying to do really all right that's let's end there so i've been putting off this China conversation because I want to actually do a whole segment on China. So sometime in the next, I hope in the next week even, we'll get back together again and we'll talk about 
the you know the quote unquote rivalry with China and what to expect from Biden and so on. Amazing. No, no, I would love to because I think that's that really does require its own. And I've been uh, working on that a lot with John Ross uh, in particular. He and I are writing a series every six weeks. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Vijay. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. Please remember at the top of the web page, there's a uh, donate button. There's a matching grant campaign on now. If 10,000 bucks, if you donate, it gets matched. If you do a new monthly or raise your existing monthly, that will get matched times 12. Um, so thanks for joining us.